And you guys can be seated. So if you haven't been with us for the last several months, then um, we want to welcome you um, and let you know that we are taking 12 months to really dive into transformation in our lives. We, we do not want to just be cute. We don't want to just have cute titles, but uh, we definitely want to see and are hungry to see growth and transformation taking shape. Now, if this is your first time to E3 Church, I'll let you know that we are an interesting group of people. We are an authentic group of people. It's our desire and passion to create an environment where people would be able to come and to be themselves. Because one thing I've learned as a pastor is that when I travel or I get on a plane or I talk to somebody, usually when I tell them that I'm a pastor, things start to change in our conversation, right? They start, stop swearing like they would normally swear and they start act, acting. So I just, I just decided, even when we started this church, you know, I'm just gonna work a full-time job so I don't ever have to tell anybody I'm a pastor so that we can have an actual dialogue and hear what's really going on in people's hearts and lives. And I think as the church at large, that we have to be the kind of people that represent are the person that we follow, which was Jesus. And Jesus went into the midst of people where they were at. He didn't wear a high hat or a sequence jacket that said miracle man or I'm super you know, awesome and more spiritual than you are. But indeed, he found himself in the, in the midst of people who, who needed help and needed transformation. And I don't know anywhere that I can go where that is not the case because people in church, out of church, Every place are just, they're just downright crazy. They all have some junk in their trunk and they all have issues that need to be resolved. But when you get a group of people who are passionate and under, they understand that God loves them and values them and they're seeking for the very best possible life, not to just put on some new Christian activities, not to just do some things so they can feel better about themselves, but truly at your core, you wanna see yourself transformed in the fullness of what God says when he looks at you, which he says, look at them. They are fearfully and wonderfully made. These are beautiful people. I have something incredible for their lives. And I don't know about you, but I, I don't want anything less than what God has promised me. I don't want anything less. I don't, I, don't want, uh, I don't want anything more. I don't want anything less. I just want everything that he says in his word to be true. And sometimes some of us who've heard uh, information, we've attended places that uh, people come and they talk about God, they, they, have, they have sort of bamboozled us into believing that what God has for us is definitely on the, de- on the down low. It's pretty, it's pretty low. But when we look at and we understand and we see God's words to us and we understand what he's given us in our identity in Christ, in our inheritance, and the things that are not because we do a bunch of stuff, but because he gave us Jesus, we start to, we start to turn our ear and put our eyes on the fact that this is, this is pretty good news. The fact that God paid the price so that I don't have to any longer think about myself. I don't have to live as a prisoner in the past, but I can grab a hold of the fullness of what God has done for me and through me in Christ Jesus, and now I can spend my time. I mean, it makes me go, oh man, let me check this out. Who am I in Christ, right? I'm in the fullness of God in Christ Jesus, that God has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness in this place that we are at right now, this earth, and in the, the uh, things to come in heaven. So it's not, you know, in the sweet by and by when we all get to heaven, God's going to be really cool. And so we can't wait till we get to heaven. No, because God told his disciples, I want you everywhere you go to tell them the kingdom of heaven has come nigh or it's come near to you. God wants us in on this action. He wants us to participate in justice and mercy and love and goodness. And he wants us to drop drop blessing bombs everywhere we go and change the environment because we know who we are in Christ Jesus. And we walk with our confidence in not ourselves, but in knowing that God has done some incredible things. And nothing, nothing will change it. And all I'm called to do is to be a believer who believes it and starts to step out and to trust it that I I don't know what's going on in your life. 
I don't know what's happening right now, but let me tell you this. I can tell you that God has plan A. Look at someone and say, God has plan A. But you say, wait, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. I don't have to because I know what God has done through Jesus. And I know that it isn't about you, it's about him. And the sooner that we recognize and put all, go all in on the fact that it's about Jesus and not about us, then we remove ourselves from the picture and we stop worrying about whether or not we did this or that or this or that or whatnot. And we can just give up on that roller coaster ride and we can enjoy the fullness and the goodness of the life that God's called us to. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, this morning, we, we've been talking as a kind of a, we, we've been seeking after what I call woo, which is wisdom and understanding. So everyone say woo. So we've been looking at Solomon's strategies. He was a trillionaire. He, he was a 12-year-old king who prayed a massive, audacious prayer that radically transformed his life when he was basically taking over as king of Israel. He just asked God for wisdom and understanding. He didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for all this. But with it, God began to just pour out on this 12-year-old's life, some incredible wisdom. And he wrote, obviously, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And so we're sort of going after it like a miner would go for gold. Let's dig in and see what we can discover and find out from Solomon's strategy. How can we apply it practically and supernaturally? Because, you know, I like the word supernatural. Let's not be scared of it, because I think sometimes it gets a bad rap. It's two words, supernatural. Okay, so sometimes when I think people think of supernatural, it, it really means super weird, super spooky, super, you know, just crazy. Am I, am I the only one who's been part of those people? But natural is normal, and so a lot of times we miss the supernatural because we're looking for the super weird instead of the super normal that's right there, which when we start to get into the kingdom of God and we start to look at the life of Jesus, we actually th see the things that are natural, that are super, that are supernatural, that actually are quite incredible. Are you with me so far? All right. And so today I want to look at, because I believe that you and I, and I know me personally, are going through all kinds of changes and situations. Could be in your, um, in your season of life you're going through a change. You might be making the transition from a person in the workforce to a person who's now retired. You could be a, a person who was once single but is now married, having to navigate the waters of somebody else's dirty underwear. You might be somebody who is uh, in a place of your work environment where everything has just exploded and changed and transformed and is completely different. And now what you're being asked of is totally different than what you were normally doing. And it just happens. Economic downturns, right? New technologies. I mean, God, Facebook, we've been on it for a while, but not that long ago, MySpace was really cool. And just, oh, so much change. And Twitter and all that stuff that you don't even have to know about. But there is a lot that takes place, and the Bible has a lot to say about it, and I want to I dive into it for us as a church, us individually, because I believe one person said that the unexamined life is not worth living, and I believe that our best is yet to come. No matter what you're facing, no matter how bleak it looks, no matter what you've gone through, your best days are yet ahead. It's a good place to say amen. I mean, your best days... You may have just experienced your worst hours, but I believe that your best days are ahead of you. I believe for our church, the best days are ahead of us. But there are some things in the midst of change and embracing change that, that I think that Solomon gives us wisdom to, and I think that the Word of God gives us wisdom so that we can understand how to navigate it, because I don't think many of us like it. I don't care if you moved some cheese or not. The book, Who Moved My Cheese, Spencer Johnson. If you haven't read it, I don't care. But the point is, is that I think when it comes up, because we like, we like things to be normal. We like things to be certain to a certain degree, right? We like things to, to be uh, in, a, in an orderly fashion, and, and, and there are some good things about that. But there is a way for us to embrace and to understand change in order for us to see the very best that is ahead of us. Can I get an oh yeah? yeah. Let's read Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 5 and just uh, listen to what Solomon says. It says, for everything there is a season, 
a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to cry, a time to laugh, a time to grieve, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to turn away, a time to search, and a time to quit searching, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to mend, a time to be quiet, in a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. What do people really get for all their hard work? I've seen the burden God has placed on us all, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He's planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. It's an important piece there. So I concluded that there's nothing better than to be happy and to enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. So Solomon is encouraging us not to live in the future, not to live in the past, but to live in the moment, in the day-by-day moment, and to recognize that regardless of what takes place, there is a season for things to live, a season for things to die, and because God's placed eternity in our hearts, We don't have to look at those situations and and grieve with such a heavy heart and such a feeling of uncertainty and pain and discourse regardless of what it is. God's placed eternity on our hearts so that we could understand that he is at work, that he is doing something always, that just because there's a cessation or a stop to what you're going through does not mean that he stopped working. Even though what is currently looks like a mushroom bomb in your life, you're going, oh my God, where is he? Well, Brooke encouraged us in worship that he lives on the inside of you. He lives on the inside of you. What we tend to do, I always call it putting the bars down on Jesus, is we tend to give voice to defeat discouragement, hurt, pain, live in, in the, as a prisoner of the past. And what we do is we lock down the reality of the fullness of life that lives on the inside of us, the hope and, and, the, and, and the good things that God's given us because we tend to put our attention onto things that kind of allow us to not see it. I mean, God lives on, on the inside of you, the fullness of God. The Bible says that you're complete in Christ Jesus. I mean, what, does complete in your mind I mean, and if God said it, does it sound like something's missing? I mean, I mean did, he should have said, like, if, if, if I wasn't complete and I was missing some things to be able to handle the roads and the, and, the, and the twists and turns and swerves of life, then he should have just said that. You are, when you're missing a couple things when it comes to difficult situations and navigating those. No, he didn't say it. He said, you're complete. You can handle this. I mean, some of you need to hear that this morning. You can handle this. I know, I know it, it feels really uncertain out here, but you can handle this. Because I'm everything, you're everything that I've said that you are, right? And what I have in store for you, I know you can't see it, but I'm at work. I'm at work, and you've got to trust it. Even though it doesn't look or make any sense right now, and you feel like everything is shut and closed, I'm at work. And so what our responsibility is to give voice to that. God, I know that you're at work. I know that your name is the name above every name. I know that you have good things in store for me. I know that you have plan A for my life. That's your responsibility to be a believer that is believing. And a believer who is believing is in the process of making those declarations in standing on God's promises and God's word. If you want to be a believer who believed, then you just go to church, get some information, forget it when you leave, go home and cry and boo-hoo. But don't be frustrated when things aren't changing in your life. It isn't the fact that God isn't there because he is always there. He never leaves you. But you have a responsibility to be a believer that is believing. Okay. Now, I want to talk through a couple of things I think that are very practical in application. But... I think will help us for the changes that are in front of us. Hebrews 12, 1. I love this passage of scripture. You know, I think sometimes because our perception and perspective 
of church, the, 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 the building of church and the, the pulpit of church is, is negative, we sometimes, you know, we, we've been bombarded with a lot of, of uh, Bible thumping and beating that, that keeps some of us at bay. And, and instead of being able to understand that, that the God, his desire is the very best for our lives. And when you start to trust that God has the very best for your lives, then you turn your attention to his word, not as some religious book, but as a romantic letter written from a father who is perfect, who cares about you immensely. And he gives you his wisdom on how to navigate life. In Hebrews 12, 1, he says, let us strip off and lay aside everything that holds us back. The reason why, you know, the majority of us during tenuous times, we press into God more is because I mean, because we're, we're feeling uncertain and vulnerable. But God's desire is to take us from glory to glory, as I said earlier. And his desire for us to strip off every weight that holds us back is so that we don't get in the, in the confusion of life where all of a sudden, here's what happens to people. When they get a bad report, and remember, the, Jesus never said that we would be free of, of, of problems in this life. In fact, he said the opposite, didn't he? He said, in this life, you're going to have troubles, trials, tribulations, but be of good cheer because I've overcome them all. In other words, there's a season for stuff in your life. It's going to happen. Things are going to seem really crappy sometimes. Has that ever happened to any of you before? <laughs> has, has anything ever been going awesome and then just crappy and you're like, oh, and then you're like, well, that's, that's just how it is for me. That's just how it is. No, it's not just how it is for you. It's like that for everybody because stuff happens even when things seem perfect. Even when you look across and see a family that everything seems perfect, you're wrong. Junk, problems, they occur. But he says, strip it off every weight that, that holds you back because it's like my son who likes to do in our house, uh, Jackson, he does naked runs. He loves to like, get out of, of the tub and just he runs the house in a naked run and until recently when he slipped on the tile floor <laughs> had a naked you know, collapse. Um. <laughs> but there's freedom, there's liberty, because when a, when a situation comes up, and this is, this is from years of experience that I've had dealing with people in turmoil and in, in, in situations that were basically, I mean, just, just crazy. The first thing that you think of is, what did I do wrong? Right? I mean, do you ever feel that way? Like, God, I didn't do enough. I didn't do enough. I didn't, I should have prayed more. I should have read the Bible more. I should have done more church things. Then this wouldn't be happening. Not true. And in fact, what that does is you start to bring up your righteousness, which means your right standing based on your efforts and energy, and it messes you up. Because now, all of a sudden, you think, oh my God, things are going bad because I didn't do this, I didn't do that. You know, a lot of people, uh, I, 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 I hate this, okay, sorry, but a lot of people are like, you know, when it comes to, and these are people that have been in church for a long time, man, I better tithe. Oh my God, we forgot to do it for six months, 10 years. And that's why God's, he's after us. No, he's not. The Bible says he chases you with his love and his mercy and his goodness. The reason we give, the reason we do it, the reason we, we, we give him that place is because of our relationship. God wants the first fruits because it's his. It's his. It, it's a matter of prioritizing so that you can put the relationship in proper order because when you do, things flow the proper way. I'll tell you, I mean, I'll be honest. I, I said this last week, I think. When I put my money, when I give God, and this isn't a message about that, but when I give him the first part and I align myself to that, guess what? I don't think as crazy about my money. It's just the way it is. If, if, I, if I sit down and I, I teach my children, hey, you know what? This is God's. What he's doing right now in our lives, financially, good, whatever. I mean, I'm just saying, like, it's his. Hey, kids, I want you to learn. This, this is, it goes to him first. And then after that, guess what happens? I don't, I, I'm not thinking about me as much. It helps to curb the appetite of spending and shopping. It's a miracle. Not to mention, I mean, other elements of it. But everything that God gives us is not for guilt and condemnation. It's not to whip you into, into shape because you stink or something like that. Are you with me? He does it out of love. Everything is out of love for him. And so the first thing that we've got to do, obviously, is to, one, get the big picture. We've got to get the big picture. In order for us to embrace change, we have to ask, okay, God, 
what are you doing right now? This, this situation right now is rocky, and, and I'm unsure, and I don't like the uncertainty, but if you don't ask, God, what are you doing? What do you got in store? I know you're at work because I know you have the best possible things for me. It becomes, it becomes difficult, doesn't it? And we've got to become a, a detective of divinity, a detective of God working in our situation. You've got to sniff it out. You can't just rely on your brain because your brain will go tilt. It goes nuts, doesn't it? This is the end. We have to sell everything. We're going down. We're going down. Right? Okay, everyone say yes because we all are there, all right? Let's, not, let's be honest. I'm not, you know, the change takes place. I'm never going to see my family again. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The reason why I know this is because it's happening to me. Okay? I know it because this is how I react. But we have to embrace change and start to make it work for us. We have to ask, rather than feeling crushed when things don't go as planned, we, ha we have to stop and think, how is this new set of circumstances going to work in our favor? How is this new set of circumstances going to work in our favor? And usually with change, we're moving uh, away from something towards something else. Now, if we focus only on moving away from something, guess what happens? We feel like we're experiencing a death, right? Anybody ha have a job change? And you were doing that thing, and that thing that you were doing is no, no longer what you're going to be doing? <laughs> How does that feel? Awesome. No, it doesn't. It feels terrible. I mean, and you feel like something just died. I mean, especially, I mean... I've, I've been doing something for nine years. And, and then it's like, oh, and I just want to sit there. And I just want to cry. I just want to cry. But if I stay there, then I'm not looking ahead into the thing that God is doing and what that something is, and I'm, I'm just kind of hanging out. How many of you know that God is, in a very relational way, always advancing and moving he is a master. What's the strategy game, Risk? I mean, is that what it is? Anybody ever, I don't, okay, none of us know, apparently. <laughs> but I mean, he knows. Uh, how about this? I just, played, uh, I just played Monopoly with my family yesterday, which was awesome. Because I, mean, I, just, I just dominated them. I mean, my, my seven-year-old son blew him away. I mean, he literally left in tears because I had taken his properties and houses. He did, but it wasn't, I didn't. It wasn't like that. But when I look at, you know, I mean, Monopoly takes some strategy. I mean, I, I, mean I, I got after it quick. I had to buy the real estate and put the houses on it so I could extract the most revenue from my, from my family. And if you don't, you're in a pinch there. But God is a master strategist. You're not. You're not. Did you know that? You're not a master strategist. Where God is taking you, he knows. You don't. And you have to trust him. You have to trust every move. As I look back over my life, God has been so efficient to me. And the steps that I've taken have always sometimes been really scary. I remember kicking and screaming going to Bible school, guys. Kicking and screaming. This was not the guy to go to Bible school. And it was crazy how it, how it worked. But within three days, I, I ended up driving, you know, several hundred thousand, whatever, miles. I don't know. I went from, from uh, California to Oklahoma. So whatever that is. I'm not going to. Not good with numbers, okay? <laughs> but the point is, is that along the way, there's always been these crazy things. And I always realized that if this other thing was taking place, then this other thing wouldn't happen. And you don't know. You don't know the behind the scenes. And your responsibility is get the big picture and start to focus on what we're going towards. There's something, everyone say, we're going towards something. I mean, I, be I believe that with all my heart, that we're going towards something. And what starts out as a challenge has the potential to cloud our vision and it can ignite a new spark that we would have never recognized under different circumstances. New businesses, all kinds of things that happen when we start to put ourselves in that proper channel. 
Listen to what Hebrews 12, 1, 2 says. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. So Jesus had to do the same thing. I wonder if the change that he had to go through when he had to go through the cross was a little taxing. And God's not asking you to get nailed to a cross, okay? Thank God, all right? He did that. But there is sometimes that feeling, and we have to look to, just like Jesus did, look to the future, see the big picture. Number two, we have to anchor to points of stability. Psalms 118.8 says, it's better to take refuge in the Lord, or it's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. So you've got to anchor yourself to some things that are certain. What are the certainties that you know? That God loves you? God has a plan for your life? That if it all, okay, just play the scenario out. Sometimes you need to. Sometimes you need to go, okay, if it all just falls apart and I die, I get to go to heaven. Okay, so just, just go ahead and end that. Because that's, I know you've been thinking in that change all kinds of crazy stuff, haven't you? Yes, you have. I know the answer. But because of all those things that you're imagining will occur or not occur, it causes you to stop creati- creativity. It causes you to stop thinking of the possibilities. It stops what God put inside of you, his spirit, his life, You stop thinking that way because you're too busy mourning a loss. You with me? I mean, some people say there's more than one way to skin a cat, you know. But when the power of God lives on the inside of you and you trust him with your life, you can anchor yourself to him. You can anchor to others, people that are surrounding you. We as a church need to embrace each other, help each other through transitions, encourage one another. I mean, it's good. This is what I always like, like... My wife and our, our relationship, when things kind of get me riled up, I like her to come alongside in that first part. And like, so if somebody just makes me mad, the first thing I want to hear from her is, let's go beat them up with a tire tool. I, I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but I appreciate that. Like, I mean, I'm not going to do it, but there's just something that, man, that makes me just way more connected to her, you know? When something makes you mad, you need someone who's like, let's do it. Let's take them out tonight, okay? <laughs> let's Jack Bauer them. Let's, whatever it's going to take, right? And then, and then everyone has a laugh because what, what is that? It's empathy. I mean, God knows where you've been. He knows. And, and when you have that initial feeling of, ah. You need someone to be like, ah, with you, don't you? You do. But you also need that person to be like, all right, all right, we plotted how to get them, but you know what? <laughs> but God, right? We trust God. God has plan A. He has good things. God's going to work. He's working on your behalf. He's not going to leave you. And then we come alongside and we help. <laughs> hey, man, what about this? You got some ideas, Right? That's what friends do. Let's talk about it. Let's, 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 let's look on the job boards. Let's find out. Did you know like in here, I mean, if we talk six degrees of separation, then you add Facebook, it's like three. Because, <laughs> I mean, you guys probably know some people that I don't know, and I know some people you don't know, and we know everybody when we put it all together. But we should be able to help one another, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, really, shouldn't, shouldn't that be the way it is? So when we find out that somebody is in need of, of a job or something, let's fire it up. And let's all believe God together so we can anchor to points of stability in people and in our church. It should be that way. So let's, that's, that's why when you come, don't just, don't remember, in, invite people into your life. Go have lunch with them. Find out what's happening. You need that. And if you're hiding that from people or you're not connected to a church in that capacity, homeboy and homegirl, you're missing the best thing that God has given us in the church at large. Don't you believe that? I mean, because I'm going to come to you and be like, hey, hey, I need some help here. All right, don't worry. I might move in with you. Number three, cultivate an attitude of non-attachment. Non-attachment. I mean, in trusting God and living moment by moment, anything, I mean, this is what God wants from us anyways. It's his. It's his. I know that you don't want to lose your Maserati, but maybe just for a season. You have to not be so attached to that thing. I know nobody has a Maserati. Maybe you do. I don't know. You with me? It was just an illustration? Okay. I'm just joking. But for a season, those are the things. God wants your heart. He doesn't want your things. He just wants to know that he has your heart. 
And you can't be so invested or attached to something that at any moment you're not willing to just let it roll and let it go. But don't lose sight. Don't not attach to the fact that God has plan A and the very best for your life. Because he does not, he does not give you less when, when there is cir- circumstances or change. So remember, he has plan A. And it will be beyond what you can ever imagine. You just need to be non-attached to things because God wants the fullness of your heart. Because that's all he ever cares about, right? I mean, didn't, didn't Jesus say those words? All your heart, all your soul, all your passion, everything. And it's a good moment when you're going through change to make the assessment. Man, how rooted was I? How, how anchored into this thing? How, how much identity was I getting from this? I know I'm not talking to any of you. I'm just talking to myself. But, I mean, it can be little things, right? I mean, little things where titles change and situations change. And all of a sudden, you're feeling so offended. How dare they? How dare they do this to me? Are, do they know? Yeah, I know because I know. I, happens. But I've realized we've got we to detach ourselves, man, because what do I want to be attached to? God. What do I want to be attached to? A relationship with him. What do I want to be attached to? His plan, his purpose. What is he doing? And if I continue to put myself in the position of a believer that is believing, then I'm standing on his promises and his word that while I can't figure it out, Because I know God, man. I mean, I know that right around the corner to this change, he's got something ridiculous in a good way. (laughs) Number four, assume responsibility. You know, we say this a lot. I probably said this in my life in the last five years more than I ever, ever, ever have. You can only be responsible for your attitude, your actions, and behavior. I mean, that's one of the core relationship things. We, we can't be responsible for other people, what they're going to do, decisions that they make. Investors, stockholders, things change. Economies change. Everything changes. If you haven't been watching, you know, you can't really, I mean, I mean, some, you know, I mean, the stock market, I think it, S&P hit an uh, enormous high, didn't it, this week? Wasn't that right? Anybody who watched? And then gold and silver, it's all over the map. It's like, you know what? I'm just, I'm just done. It doesn't mean I'm not going to take the assessment and the proper uh, responsibility with what I have. But my responsibility is, is my attitude, my action, and my behavior. And there's been moments when, when change has occurred that I have not been, the, 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 I haven't been responsible for those things. I've let my emotions fly. And you know what happens to me? I, I get stressed. Uh, Jeff had a, had a class here yesterday, um, and uh, he was telling us that, did you know it, it was the, uh, now I'm having to bring up an illustration that I don't really know very well, but he was talking about the fact that we could actually, we could actually fear and stress ourselves into a heart attack, essentially, right? I mean, you can put so much fear and thought that you could actually have a heart attack just by doing, don't, don't, don't just, you know, feel all stressed out right now, okay? What I want you to recognize is that the, the other side of that is true. That if you, can, if you can bring up so much calamity, then you can bring up so much hope and goodness and fortitude and strength that you can look ahead and you can have the peace of God rule and reign in your heart by just giving voice and attention to it, right? And you need that. In the midst of change, you gotta have it. You need to know that if God is for me, who can be against me? I mean, doesn't that just lift your heart just a little bit? I mean, if God is for me, who can be against me? So you're responsible. I mean, the, uh, the serenity prayer says, A, God grant us the serenity to accept the things we can't change, which is the attitude of non-attachment, non-atta- and then B, the courage to change the things we can. So what right now, God, what are you speaking? What are you saying? What are some areas that I need to make an adjustment? Where have I, where have I put a little too much stake into claim? Because this, this change represents an opportunity for transformation and, a tra- and an opportunity for incredible things because we said it before, our best days are yet ahead. Now I appreciate because you guys have allowed me to be me uh, at E3 Church and you've you, you have, I mean, a lot of you over the years, we've, we've had some incredible, you know, I mean, just changes and steps and things that have occurred. I mean, I remember our, our first services were at the Scottsdale Community College. 
And I remember going in, we had, my brother had built a cappuccino bar and we had to load up, isn't it during the, kind of getting towards the summertime and uh, we would load in and load out uh, early mornings on Sunday mornings and uh, oh, just lots of fun guys. And I remember walking in one time, just trying to get everything done and, and there was a corner on the edge of the cappuccino machine that I just drilled myself and I just had, you know, blood gushing down my face and I'm like, awesome, this message is going to be, I mean, it's going to be Braveheart-esque. <laughs> and going from then and then the, the uh, then the, uh, the community college said, hey, listen, we want you to know we're not going to be able to put on the air conditioners during summer. So, you know, so we're there for three months. Then another change comes, right? And, you know, I'm like, oh, awesome. You know, we set out to, to plant this thing. God's given us a heart and, and vision. And, and over the years, we've had a lot of just kind of things that have taken place. But when you look at a group of people that, uh, that God brings together and Man, do I, am I thankful for this space. I'll just tell you, I am. You, 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 may, you may go, well, you know, I mean, there's other amazing spaces, but I don't know of anybody who is excited about just this space as I am. I don't. Why? Because I have hustled and moved. We've set up on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. I mean, we have gotten after it for years. Amen, Amen to anybody who's been there? But let me tell you what has happened in the process. If I would have hated that process, one of the greatest things occurs, listen to this people who just don't just attend church, participate, here's why. Because when people build, they bond. When people build, they bond. And the things that have, have shaped within all of us, because it's not my church, it's us. As we've, as we've navigated together, it's built relationships that are strong and people that are real. And I, I could tell you, all of us that have experienced what we've, we've been through, man, we love it. We love it, what God's done in us. We wouldn't give it up. And my wife and I often say that, like, we, we don't think if, if, if E3 um, and what God was doing didn't, didn't exist, we wouldn't, we wouldn't go to church anymore. I'm just kidding, okay? But I just, I wanted to say that. <laughs> it's awesome. There's other, there's great churches. We're all on the same team. Just going to say that. But this, this morning, this morning what I want you to recognize is that that change that's there, God's going to, he's, he's at work. Amen? Amen? He's at work and he is doing something beyond what you can imagine. And before you freak out, before you space out, before you drop out, I want us to look up. I want us to look up because he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the author and the finisher of the story that he's writing in your life. And it is not even begun to get crazy. It is a good one. Amen? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that what you have for us because of your love for us so rich and so amazing. Father, forgive us for not trusting, not, not realizing and recognizing that you do have plan A for us getting into hyper mode and feeling all that uncertainty and the weight of it. Lord, we just want to cast it onto you this morning. We can't do it. We can't take it. We can't wear it. We're not equipped. You are. God, I'm asking for us, for each of us, for the peace that passes all understanding to guard and to guide, to guard and to guide, to guard and to guide. Lord, we need protection. We need your peace to protect us from getting bitter and hurt. And Father, we need your guidance as we begin to look to you to help us to see what you have in store for us. No, Lord, you just sometimes give us pictures, but we're latching on to your hope. We're latching on to your peace. We're latching on to your character, to your goodness, because you're trustworthy. Father, we thank you for plan A. We thank you for plan A. We thank you for plan A. We thank you that it's because of Jesus. We thank you that you have and are working on our behalf. In Jesus' name. This morning, while every head is bowed and every eye closed, two invitations. Number one is if you don't know or have a relationship with God, you don't know what he did in sending his son Jesus as a sacrifice because he loved you and he's been chasing you every moment of every day. He cares about you. And Jesus went to the cross and shed his blood as a sacrifice because that was the only thing that could cover the sin, issues, and he did it. 
so that you could become a child of God and experience the fullness of God's grace and his love. If you're here and you don't have a relationship with God and this morning you want to, and God loves you, he cares about you, would you lift your hand and say, pray for me? Real quick, anybody. Second, if you're here and the change that I'm talking about this morning is right smack dab in the middle of where you are and you're in the middle of that and you are trying to fight it, you're trying to put your your fists up, but you are just, you feel like you've just felt like the wind has gotten knocked out of you. I believe that God supernaturally wants to do something in here. And if that's you and you say, yes, that's where I'm at. Would you lift your hand and say, yes, pray for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we're going to pray for each other on this one though. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to, I just want you to, there's a person sitting in front of you. I I don't need you to circle up or anything strange. All all I want you to do is I just want you to lean forward and I want you to just pray for the person that's in front of you. Just put your hands on their shoulder. Can you do that for me? This doesn't sound too weird there, but just lean forward. It'll be like a daisy chain. And in an out loud voice, maybe some of you, you don't do this, okay? The out loud voices, we're just gonna pray for each other, all right? And you know, maybe, you know, maybe you just get a sense in your heart that God has something for you to pray for that person that's in front of you, and, and we're gonna do that, all right? So I'm just gonna be quiet for just a second, because I know you want me to be, and then I'm just gonna pray. So let's just, let's just be quiet and sensitive just for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you that when two or three are gathered together in your name, that you're right there in the midst. Father, I thank you that as hands and people are connected this morning, that there is a supernatural presence, a supernatural uh, feeling of peace and comfort right now that's flowing in this place. Father, I thank you that today is not a day of just doing church, but being it and seeing it that we're seeing that you are supernatural, supernaturally moving in the midst of the needs of these people, on their hearts and their families and their jobs and their circumstances. Father, I thank you that there is an awakening taking place to the reality that you are working things together for our good. God, I expect phone calls from the middle of nowhere job opportunities beyond anybody's possible comprehension. Supernatural jobs and supernatural finances to start coming in from the north, south, east, and west. Unexpected situations to start taking shape. God, we know that you alone, you own a cattle on a thousand hills, you hold in your palm this earth, this world, And Father, as people that are participating to believe that you are greater, that you are bigger, that you are at work, Lord, this week, for testimonies and reports and situations where things that have been laid dormant in people's hearts are starting to come to life, where people who are asking questions, God, what are you up to? That God, you're revealing yourself to them in an incredible way, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.